welcome to everybody. My name is Marsha Robinson. I'm the membership coordinator here at CIFA, and I'll be your producer for today's webinar. I'd like to welcome you to the CIFA member to member webinar, Logistics MA, Maximizing Value for Sellers, being brought to you today by Logiston Advisors. I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items before we begin. For the duration of the webinar, your mics um, will be muted and should remain muted. If you have a question or a comment, please type it in the chat. If you lose the ability to hear the presentation, please log out of the webinar, unplug your headset or speakers, plug them back in, and then log back into the session. Uh, the webinar will run for approximately one hour, and then we'll move into the Q&A portion of the session. Our main presenter for today is Nikhil Saith, Managing Director at Logis and Advisors. Nikhil is a visionary pro-growth and transformational leader known in the North American 3 pale industry with a unique blend of many years of experience in financial stewardship, P&L management, and M&A. Nikhil has a proven track record of successfully running both buy side, sell side, and strategic engagements for mid-sized logistics and transportation firms. Nikhil deeply understands the operating strategic needs that your management team should consider in order to successfully run an M&A process within the logistics space. He'll be joined by panelists Ron Liebman, partner at McCarter in English, Michael Olson, managing director at Logiston Advisors, and Aaron Valtier, managing director at Strategies Wealth Advisors. Nikhil, I now turn the webinar over to you. Thank you, Marsha. Good afternoon, good morning, uh, depending on which part of the US and Canada you live in. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to be uh, facilitating this educate, educational uh, sessions. This is the second that we are doing in the last 15 days. We did one for the buyers about a couple of weeks back, and this is the sailors one, the maximizing value for the sailors. Um, very interesting uh, times in the industry. So we are just coming out of the pandemic. A uh, tremendous amount of resilience that our industry has shown over the last uh, 18 plus months. A uh, lot of logistics companies have been hitting the ball out of the park uh, and have been solidifying margins and increasing profits. Uh, I've never seen an M&A market as strong as it is today. Uh, Indefinitely, sailors market uh, has always been. Uh, a lot of dry powder out in the market, a lot of liquidity. The subject market is almost back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, underwriters are writing risk. Uh, a lot of m is happening. The fragmentation of the market provides for uh, a lot of scalability, consolidation, and defragmentation. Uh, financial sponsors, uh, strategic buyers, um, strategic assets owned by private equity firms, to create accredited growth. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel today. I'm uh, delighted. The, the job of a moderator becomes very easy when you have people like Ron, Michael, and Aaron on the panel. Um, a little bit about Logisyn before we move on. Um, and thank you, Marsha, for that generous introduction that you, you started the session. Uh, 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 Logisyn is a mid-market leader in transportation logistics M&A, focused on the North American footprint, both Canada, U.S. Uh, we do work with the buy side clients all over the world. Uh, we predominantly work on the sell side uh, targets within the North American uh, market. Uh, we are focused on m and we are focused on logistics and transportation. What is different in Logisyn is we are operators that do m and not the m and is done by traditional bankers. Uh, with our combined teams, we have 125 plus years of C-level experience uh, with people like Michael, Ron, Chris, Jan. I think we, we bring a tremendous amount of bandwidth uh, to the table and a, a tremendous uh, depth in different domain expertise. We have 230 closed deals uh, in transportation space. 
Uh, we, we have a very tailored strategy, optimal partnership. We have bought, sold, and operated logistics companies for over three decades, uh, developing a very keen sense of marketplace. Um, often the question comes to valuations, and this is a hot topic in the industry. Um, always people talk about what is the enterprise value? Um, we know that it's hard to answer the question about the enterprise value unless we really understand the, what the type of asset it is. But what we can tell you that there are certain factors that detracts the value and, and drives the value. Um, I love this slide. It basically tells you there are quantitative, qualitative, and the process factors that really enhances or detracts the value. And as a sailor, as an entrepreneur, as a founder, you always want to be on the positive side uh, to really drive that enterprise value. The accelerator and a multiplier effect of the revenue, uh, financial matrix, the qualitative matrix, and the process efficiencies that really drive the process forward. Uh, m a opportunities are never found. They are often developed. The sailors need to think ahead about their exit strategy and about really planning their enterprise value. Estate planning, cash planning, tax planning uh, has to be done in a very meticulous way. Um, people often ask the question, what is the EBITDA multiples? And I, I always say to people that EBITDA multiples are overemphasized. That number is, that magic number is always overemphasized. What is important is that we run financial models and then we back into a 12 months trailing free cash flow and then get that magic number, what we call an EBITDA multiple. It, what drives the value is the multiple, multiples of dynamic is the financial matrix, how the company has been consistently doing. You have a six to eight quarters of consistent growth, your scale and size, your nature differentiator, your growth opportunities and consistency of performance. No hockey stick. Um, you need to be very consistent in your performance to drive the maximum value. I'm not suggesting if you have uneven performance or inconsistent performance, you can be sold. There is a value, but it's not as good as you have been consistently performing because that de-risks the strategy for the buyers. Um, the, the, the chart on the right-hand side will tell you some of the pulse in the market in terms of what the EBITDA multiples are, and I would qualify this, that this data is based on some of the known deals that we have captured, or um, uh, it's the public domain deals. A lot of private company deals do not get captured in the, into the data, so that data may be a little skewed. Um, the largest in difference, and I think, I think we talked about the largest in difference is we are the operators that we also do m and uh, We have a tremendous amount of depth, depth in a network and opportunities that we can bring. Financial sponsors, strategic buyers, and family funds. Deep industry knowledge, understand performance drivers, and active m and presence, uh, like these educational sessions that we run from time to time. It's my utmost pleasure to now introduce our uh, uh, panelists. Um, each one of them bring a tremendous amount of expertise to the table. Um, Ron Lidman, I've known him as a transportation attorney, as, as a friend. Um, somebody always calls spade a spade. No matter of the, what time of the day I talk to him, he will always give me his very truthful, candid opinion. A very distinguished attorney and known for his expertise uh, in the space. Michael Olson, my esteemed colleague at uh, uh, Logistics Advisors, brings a, a very unique experience from the recruitment industry, uh, and uh, he's spanning his M&A uh, uh, domain now with uh, that kind of a network. Aaron Valdier, um, you know, when entrepreneurs and founders and owners are really talking about monetizing and really talk about the proactive strategy, how do we manage our cash flow and estate planning and tax planning? I think uh, Strategies Wealth and Aaron's team provide that immense value to the owners and founders that helps them to really understand the dynamic. What is the net proceeds in my hand? Uh, and what is the, the dynamic that I want to talk about, the enterprise value? 
With that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to the speakers for their opening remarks. Uh, I'm going to put up their bio slide while the speakers are speaking, and then we will open the Q&A. I want this to be as in informative, as interactive, and as exchange of ideas session. So I'm sure each one of you will be as candid and as uh, forthright about what you see in the market. Um, always a pleasure to get your run first. Uh, Why do I always have to go first? <laughs> so, um, anyway, I'm Ron Liebman. I've been in this business in various ways for the past, I hate to admit, 44 years. Um, I've been an operator in senior management in uh, both corporate logistics and on the transportation side, including with a large German freight forwarder. Moved to be a lawyer about 26 years ago. Um, myself and my firm, I head up our transportation logistics and supply chain group. We are an end-to-end -end practitioner. If it moves, we can handle it. We go from a purchase of raw materials through final sale, outsourcing, insourcing, obviously M&A, et cetera. Um, it's a very exciting time to be in this field. I mean, let's face it, part of what's driving the M&A market is this focus on supply chain. I just came from a supply chain conference with shippers this morning, you know, and many of them are scared of this environment and many of them may be looking to get out for that reason. Also, you know, Nikhil mentioned valuations. Yeah, you know, I looked at statistic evaluation yesterday. You know, the the average even of multiple is up. So everything points to this being a good time to sell. And I think for the first time in my lifetime, um, there's enough understanding of how mid-sized, in particular, companies can fit in and accrete growth to uh, larger providers or give them additional verticals. And I think. That's why we're seeing what we're seeing with the various deals out there. Thank you, Ron. Um, Michael? Yes, thank you, Nikhil. Appreciate the chance to get on your, on your panel today. Um, so my name is Michael Olsen. Um, my background is uh, on the uh, international freight forwarding side. Uh, started in the industry back in the early 90s, um, have worked in Europe and uh, the U.S. for the past uh, some 20, 24 years, <clears throat> um, worked for various uh, multinational companies. Um, for the past five years, I've been focused mainly on uh, consulting and especially m and and uh, joined Logis in a couple of years ago. <clears throat> Um, and I think Nikhil already gave a, a good overview of, of who Logison is. So I'll just add to that that, um, and as Nikhil mentioned, we we are really logistics people and people that have uh, experience from the logistics industry that are doing uh, M and A, and that's the only industry that we focus on. And and we like to say that we have walked in our clients' shoes. We've all been part of building up companies, buying companies, selling companies. Um, so we speak the language uh, of our clients, and uh, and because we have um, uh, everybody has a lot of uh, uh, many years experience in the industry, our network, um, which is probably the most important thing, is 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 very large, both with uh, strategic uh, buyers in in the industry and um, and financial buyers. So um, to piggyback a little bit on, on what Ron said, uh, it's an interesting market right now. Companies, most companies um, are doing really well in our industry. Um, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of companies, meeting with a lot of companies. Um, they're actually struggling to keep up um, and, and even turning away business. Uh, so, uh, so doing very well, which um, of course builds into uh, whether it's a good time to, um, to perhaps thinking about uh, an, an exit strategy and an exit plan. So we will, uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Aaron, you're the next. Thanks, Miguel. So um, I'm Aaron Valdir, Managing Director at Strategies Wealth Advisors. We're an independent registered investment advisory firm 
uh, with offices in Chicago and in, in the Midwest United States. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you again, Nikhil, for in, inviting me um, to be to ha be having a conversation with with you and um, and industry experts, and then also entrepreneurs. Our firm is uh, you know serves exclusively owners of private businesses and their families, and um, you know, not to go too philosophical here, but we do believe that entrepreneurs, like many of the folks uh, uh, participating in this webinar, are you know the backbone of North America and our economy. They don't always get the headlines, um, but uh, that's what gets gets us out of bed in the morning is is supporting these entrepreneurs as they approach the mountaintop and uh, helping them enjoy some time at the top, and then. Uh, helping guide through some of the challenges that exist on the way back down the mountain. So thanks for having me. I will weigh in. Um, I'm not uh, an industry expert, so I'm going to let Michael and Ron uh, handle the um, uh, the ins and outs of the industry. But I will share in terms of EBITDA multiples and, and where I think the deal-making world is headed. I think for as long as credit stays loose, um, I think you're going to see a uh, continue to have a hot deal market, whether through strategic or financial buyers. Credit, loose credit means that uh, equities are the place to be, private equities included. And so um, our expectations are that um, the credit will continue to be loose for at least the foreseeable future. So um, what was you know potentially tax driven by sellers and, and sort of the urgency leading up to the end of the year, I think uh, maybe more appropriately should be or sh uh, should have been associated with the availability of, of credit and, and where that has, you know, so look at the Fed and see what they're doing um, in terms of rates. And I think that's a great guidepost. I think we'll have a hot m and market uh, for the next year because of that. that that's super. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, uh, I think getting three very different perspectives on a panel, it's, uh, it's going to drive a lot of value to our attendees. And uh, we are ho hoping to get this uh, session recorded and available to those who are going to miss this session today. Uh, I'm going to start by asking the first question to our panel. Let's talk about COVID-19, which is obviously on our minds. It's still not over. Uh, but we are now hopefully towards the tail end of uh, the pandemic. We've gone through a lot. The logistics industry has been the net winner, I would say, through the process. What do you think are your insights on how sailors are impacted due to COVID in the last 18 plus months? We continue to see a sailors market. Uh, how do you see your clients in your respective domains, whether it's uh, financial planning, whether it's uh, attorneys and M&A and transportation side of the business? And Michael, you are at the close to action in terms of M&A. How do you see COVID is impacting uh, sailors? Uh, and whether it's valuation, whether it is expectations, whether it is time to distance, give us your insights as to how COVID has impacted the MA and the sailors generally. Uh, well, Ron? I think it's. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Go ahead. You were, you were asking me. Sorry. No, I, I would say from my side, it's, it's so it's been interesting because in, in the beginning of of, um, of of last year when COVID really uh, started out. And nobody really knew what was going to happen, and, and 2020 became a, a sort of a weird year. But now it turns out to be uh, a, a great thing, probably in terms of um, of transportation and logistics. And uh, as I said before, most companies in the industry right now are doing extremely well. Um, uh, I would say for uh, the asset-like companies, the freight forwarders, <clears throat> the customs house brokers, um, one of their biggest problems right now is actually cash flow. Um, and, and because we have, we're have we seeing very, very high freight rates and, and higher rates than we've ever seen. Uh, container rates have spiked, air freight rates have spiked. Um, so there's, there's an enormous um, <clears throat> strain on, on the cash flow uh, for most companies. And at the same time, there's a, a labor shortage. So 
uh, because of the congestions we see in the industry and, and everything being backed up, um, uh, companies are struggling just servicing and, and handling their customers. Um, and uh, uh, each shipment takes a lot more manpower, a lot more uh, time to handle than it used to. Um, so they need more labor to handle these shipments and they simply can't find that labor. So companies are fighting over staff at the moment <laughs> and um, and trying to make sure that they can continue to service um, uh, their clients. Um, so uh, from an M&A perspective, um, uh, this has also changed the market uh, and it, it is currently a seller's market, no doubt about that. Um, and that's simply just a matter of, of, a, of a supply and demand uh, scenario. So um, there, are, there are more buyers than there are sellers currently. And that, of course, uh, opens some opportunities uh, for sellers, but certainly also um, for buyers <clears throat> um, that are doing well. And uh, uh, because they're doing well, they're making money. Um, they have money to go out and, and spend on on doing acquisitions. Um, we see the same thing also on, on, the, um, on the financial side for the financial buyers. Uh, there's a lot of money sitting out there, uh, dry powder, uh, as we call it, uh, waiting to be deployed. Um, uh, it's currently, I think, about $1.5 trillion, something like that, and about 10% uh, uh, of that is, is allocated towards this industry. So, um, a very exciting time um, on the sell side. I think what Michael says about the money that's sitting out there is very much a driver, certainly end of the year driver, as far as PEs go, and the possibility of having to return capital. So, I think that's partially what we've seen. But I think we often try to say, make broad generalizations about the, an industry that's really straight. So. First, you have to take the Port of LA, Port of Los Angeles issue out of this. That involves a small part of the supply chain. It involves basically westbound, eastbound freight coming out of the Orient, mainly Vietnam and China, um, where, for example, there isn't a shortage of drivers. There's a shortage of chassis. There were chassis that could move the freight. So let's look at the broader scale and what's happening domestically in Canada. In, in terms of that, there's an understanding that there is less capacity nowadays than there is freight, be it dependent on e-commerce, whatever reason, you could list many reasons, that is a truth. There is a long-haul driver shortage, that is a truth, certainly smaller than the American Trucking Association estimated three years ago when they said about 200,000, now they're down to 67,000, but still significant. So what I think you're saying, is the understanding of smart buyers that acquiring capacity is, for lack of a better term, a guaranteed profit, particularly you know, if it's a bolt on and you're just adding something new to what you do. And to the PEs, at least the ones that you, know, you call them who have strategic, you know, do strategic buys and are doing roll-ups, be it you know, any of the folks, AI Logistics, any of those kinds of companies, I think that's understand, their understanding that as much capacity as they can get makes them more important. The more important they are, the more profit positive they should be. And so I think it's really, it's real true supply and demand, as someone said. I, I think Aaron said that this is a supply and demand situation, and buyers are seeing that. You know, and again, they are seeing things like you know, record profits, you know, just looking back at LA, in this horrible crisis when nothing is moving, the nine major steamship lines have posted rec record profits and are said to be, they're going to give out record dividends. So obviously, if you are mask lines, you have plenty of capital to put into e-businesses, which they're doing. Um, and just real quickly to sum that up, there's also the difference in the marketplace between traditional and e-businesses and why people are investing when they're investing. And as Nikhil and I often talk about, e e investing in e-businesses is speculation like, like anything else. So I think we're mainly talking right now in this context about traditional brick and mortar warehousing, trucking, et cetera. 
Ellen? Uh, you know, I'll just kind of getting back to the question around COVID. Um, and again, not not having near, nearly as much industry expertise as, as Ron and Michael, but um, you know, what it we as I mentioned, we work with private business owners. We're constantly having a conversation about um, their strategy for their business and particularly when they get to an inflection point around the exiting of their business. I think COVID just introduced some uncertainty that um, pushed them to kind of pick up, pick their heads up above uh, the, the great years that they had been having and call some question into whether the future was going to be as rosy. And then and then I think what added to that was that quick rebound for many of the organizations that we support. And um, those two together, you know, the fact that it, it, it um, it became a seller's market quickly once again, and the uncertainty that was created um, back in March of 2020. I think uh, you know COVID has made our clients more curious about what the what the M and A market looks like. Yeah, Aaron. Just one thing I'm wondering: are your are your clients also looking to the eventuality of when the recession finally does hit? And that this is maybe you know pre-recession best time to get out. I think they. Um, I think that's right. Yeah, I think they realized that um, uh, many of them had gone through you know the uh, 2007 to 2009 and the global financial crisis. And you know, although that seems like a long time ago, I think it hit. They remember how that hit their business, and um, in that, you know now we've had this great run. Um, I think COVID was a reminder that business cycles happen and that um, recessions need to happen. Uh, you know, I've, I've been doing a lot of uh, research around inflation and to the extent we see permanent inflation, the only way out, as demonstrated in the early 1980s, is a is a pretty painful recession. Um, so, you know, 60s and 70s, we had this uh, situation where the Fed and, and fiscal policy was hyper focused on low unemployment which um, you know, created these inflation issues. The Fed could never really keep up on that um, because of the political challenges. Well, Volcker and Reagan get together and unlikely pair and they you know, put the economy through some pain in order to reset pricing. And so if, if we do, you know, if people do remember that, I think economists do, and if that comes full circle here in 2022, maybe at the tail end of the year, you could see a, a big move in rates to combat that inflation. And once that happens, you know, unemployment um, going north and uh, a looming recession. Absolutely. I think that really gets us a segue to move on to um, another critical aspect of MA. Um, I think in terms of the COVID, we have seen the port congestion, the driver shortages, huge imports coming into the United States and Canada. Uh, the consumer travels, money travels, people are beginning to get back on their life, uh, economic activities being driven. Um, in, in terms of the MA, Michael suggested, I think he's absolutely right, uh, that too many buyers and too much of capital chasing deals, it's even more compounded. It has more exacerbated in the in the last uh, 12 or 18 months because of the secular credentials in the transportation industry the investors after technology is considering logistics as the investment area. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's why you are seeing a lot more dollars being allocated to logistics uh, because of very secular credentials. Let me ask you a question, Aaron. Uh, we always get asked that question by the entrepreneurs and founders that we give them a sense of what the enterprise value is but they don't have a sense of the net proceeds in their hands. Um, so the tax planning, the estate planning, and the cash flow planning is a very critical aspect of m and uh, We always like these founders and owners to be proactive about this process and not reactive post LOI. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you see this playing out? I would love to. Um, so I mentioned, you know, our, our core is working with entrepreneurs and business owners. Um, and in order to support them, uh, we've built out a team of uh, CPAs and, and lawyers and certified financial planners in order to sync up what can be some pretty sophisticated needs 
uh, both pre-transaction and post-transaction. Uh, my background was uh, as a as an M&A attorney prior to um, kind of falling in love with the markets at the University of Chicago for my MBA. So um, uh, there's a couple things to think about, and you alluded to them, Nikhil. First, there are some really important uh, timing issues that come with the personal planning. So as uh, entrepreneurs are gearing up for an event like this, they're hyper-focused on maximizing enterprise value. However, you miss certain opportunities, and I would say there are really three key times to be thinking about those opportunities. Um, and I'll get to what those opportunities are, at least generally, but the three time, times to think about them are pre-LOI, between the time the LOI is signed and the deal is closed, and then within the 60-day uh, period after close. Um, and the reason those three periods are important is because they offer a great time to do some tax planning, to transfer some wealth tax-free, to sort of double dip on the tax benefits for philanthropy. Um, and again, to the extent you can take advantage of those, of those tax advantages really depends on how much of forethought, how much planning, how far ahead of, of that you get. Um, it often becomes an afterthought because the priority really is and should be the sale of the business. But, um, you know, that's why I like to think, you know, Nikhil, we, we can work so well together if we're getting some of these post closing items locked in, then we give the peace of mind for the entrepreneur to go full, full bore through the transaction. Um, and then you also mentioned, let's not look at gross proceeds and let's not compare our, our pre-sale lifestyle. Let's really sharpen the pencil, do some sensitivity analysis around uh, cash flow planning. I'm going to create a whole new engine for wealth, right? I had this thing that I could count on and now I'm maybe getting into a new environment with a, with a portfolio that, you know, I don't, uh, I, you know, I don't see and touch every day necessarily, but it can be, um, it can be quite a new thing. And so getting their arms around that is really important for us as well. That's super helpful. Um, uh, Ron, we, we see deals all the time and lawyers on both sides play uh, sometimes you see over lawyering on the deals and there's a very critical aspect of it. Um, what would you say about uh, the deal making ability and picking the right attorneys to ensure that the deal gets through to the finish line? I think the most important thing you could do with a lawyer in anything you do, an M&A being no different, financing is being no different, is getting someone who understands your industry and your business. Or, as often happens in m and deals in the logistics space, getting firms who can work together. One perhaps being just, uh, you know, a, a large-scale M&A firm, the other being a firm that handles the labor and the logistics-related due diligence matters like that. So you get the expertise of both if, if one or the other doesn't have it. And typically that's the case. Um, one size fits all gets you nothing because you and that's when you get over wearing. So if you take folks that just are used to doing, you know, typical finance deals and they have their SPAs or APAs, they throw them out there. And then you got to create something that actually fits the business. And then there's lots of handling back and forth and people like, you know, you guys have to get involved and lawyers are drafting and redrafting. The simplest thing is vet the lawyers, make sure that they work in your space, make sure that they understand your business and are not just lawyers who say they do. And, you know, lawyers are the one of the great bastions of profit maximization. So lawyers will say what they have to to get a deal. It's really client beware and just do your due diligence. That's super helpful. Um, Michael, do you have to say anything about the, the proactive planning that Aaron talked about and any experiences you have about 
uh, how as investment bankers, you, your, your ability to close the deals by really working with all these advisors to help our client ultimately to ensure that they have a peace of mind, they run the business, they maximize the value, they maximize all the, the tax, cash planning, and the estate advantages. How, uh, what do you say? Um, well, that's definitely uh, the, the planning part is important, right? So you, you want to make sure that 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 you plan ahead uh, of, of an exit. Um, and like you said, number one is is you want to make sure you have you have a good team in your corner. So you want you want to hire an expert advisor, a team of expert advisors, um, someone who specializes in the industry, and, and um, um, uh, somebody who has a network. Um, so when we look at at finding buyers, um, somebody who has has a network for both uh, strategic and and financial uh, buyers, um, that that'll greatly enhance your your um, chances of maximizing the the, um, the outcome and the proceeds from the deal, um, and then you want to bring in someone, um, as you mentioned, also in the queue, someone who can run the process for you and uh, and has the bandwidth to do that, um, and, can, and can bring multiple buyers to the table. We have a, a saying that 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 goes something like uh, one buyer is really no buyer, so you want to make sure that. That you get multiple um, buyers to the table. Uh, other things you can do to prepare you you, you can um, uh, you you want to focus on what you're good at. Um, you can, you can't be be everything to everybody. Uh, you don't want to spread yourself uh, too thin. Um, buyers generally like companies. I love companies that are that excel in their specific area. Um, you want to. I would say as a seller, you typically know which areas maybe you can improve on, uh, whether that's um, your, your management team that maybe needs some strengthening that you can do in advance. <clears throat> Make sure you have the right players on uh, on, on, on your team uh, internally. Uh, uh, you can um, <clears throat> make sure that you have or try and tailor your, your business model in a way that it's scalable, which will make it attractive to a buyer. That they can see, okay, we can come in here and actually scale what this company is, is doing already. Um, there can be things that you want to try and even out if you have a lot of customer concentration. Um, try and become uh, 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 less less uh, um, focused on on just a few clients and, and spread out the risk more. Uh, you want to make sure you you are uh, as much as you can be. Uh, um, on top of, of the technology, which is so important right now, visibility tools, etc., and many other things. Um, uh, in, in general, a, a well diversified company is what buyers like to see. And then, of course, the, the timing is, is important. And like we're talking about now, the timing as a seller right now is is very good. And, and in the end of the day, it, uh, a lot of it comes uh, comes down to the timing. And then. To Aaron's uh, uh, point, you also, of course, uh, from a personal point of view, want to have um, a financial advisor who can uh, cover that side of things for you. I, I think another thing, you know, and everyone is always reticent to say this, deals are expensive. Deals are either expensive or very expensive, depending on who your advisors are. Yes. There is, if you get it, the lawyer on the corner, the accountant on the corner is not advising you in selling your company. And if they are, it's foolish. They don't, as a general rule, they will not know how to. And at the end of the day, the hourly rate might be less. Either something is either going to go wrong or you won't get the right deal. And that's important. And, you know, because you can, and there's additives depending on what your company is like. For example, I have clients who often do pre-diligence. They hire companies to come in and run the generalized diligence on the company, financial and otherwise, to try to find red flags, and often do. And some of them are significant red flags. Um, you know, so a, a good advisor will be able to pick out when you need to utilize that, and it may seem like an additional cost, but I, I've had clients that I've seen had, while they couldn't fix all the issues, had answers for all the issues when it was time to do management conversations. And then we, we were prepared for the question. 
So, you know, that I just like to say that again, you know, there's a value you should be getting. You shouldn't be getting ripped off, obviously, but there is no such thing as a cheap deal, be it Nikhil's fee or Aaron's fee or my fee or whoever else comes in, your, um, your accountants, your auditors. You, you have to be ready for that and calculate it. Yeah, I think one, um, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't want to belabor the point, but just maybe share a, a different perspective on a, on a, on a similar point. Um, was, you know, in preparation for this conversation, was thinking on the three dozen or so uh, entrepreneurs we've supported through transactions on the wealth management side over the last couple of years. And, uh, and I would say, you know, the vast majority uh, didn't really need, wouldn't have needed Ron's pep talk. You know, 90% of them see the value at the outset. The 10%, you know, the three to four that decided to go it alone, I think, you know, what in, in our conversations, what was going on there was, you know, um, they had built the company by biting off a little more they could than they could chew, and they grew significantly because of it. And they'd always kept costs low, right? And there had never sometimes, you know, oftentimes there are only sporadic legal issues that come up. And so, um, having an expert or or you know very specific M and A attorney, they didn't have knowledge of the need there. So my my point is just that what got you to creating this great enterprise value isn't necessarily what you need to get to the finish line and maximize that enterprise value. Uh, Michael, you said it, one buyer is no buyers. Um, in those three to four deals, the amount of retrading that went on, it just not only did it frustrate the, the seller and um, not allow them to do what they were good at, but um, in, in a couple of cases, it just, it, it soured them on the process entirely. Um, I think one, you know, in one other situation, not being able, the, the concern was that a, a banker might not be able to position their company appropriately, um, you know, the sense that investment bankers are maybe generalized or um, uninformed as to their industry. And so, you know, I again, I, I don't own an investment banking firm. I'm not affiliated with any of them. I just can speak from a particular perspective here. And um, and I just know that, you know, Michael used the term maximize outcome. If the, if the desire is to truly maximize the outcome, then uh, spend the money, right, Ron? And um, and it'll come back in space. Yes. Um, I want to get to one important question on this panel before our time is up. And this is always my favorite question. Uh, how important are earning multiples versus other factors in evaluating a 3PL investment? We always talk about multiples, but what are the multiples and other factors that you have to consider to evaluate an investment? Is Are the multiples overemphasized? It's my favorite question. I always ask this because it creates a lot of good discussion. I'll, I'll let Michael go first because that's his domain. And obviously, Ron, I know you've got a really good opinion about it. Yeah, you could give my answer for me, you know, my heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's uh, like you said, Nikhil. It's uh, it, it's a it's a good topic. So we we get the question all the time, right? And especially right now, because people hear, okay, the, the valuations are high. So people call us and they ask, you know, what are the current multiples um, in the industry? How much can I sell my company? What what should I expect? And of course, the answer is, you know, it depends because not 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 two companies are the same. Um, so. Uh, are multiples important? I think they are because it's it's sort of a, a universal method to come up with that, at least a general valuation idea. Um, and you know, you take your EBITDA, your adjusted EBITDA, and and, and you you multiply uh, multiply by a multiple, and that gives you the the enterprise value, um, uh, at least for asset like companies. Um, but it's only a guideline because there's so many other things that go into into the valuation, uh, you know. And we've touched on some of these already. So, how are you doing financially now? How have you doing? How have you done? You know, historically, have you done? How have you done over the last uh, three to five years? Um, you might be doing well right now, but is it just a hockey stick? Um, is, is this sustainable? Something that that a buyer will obviously look at. Um, and then all these other things come into play, you know, such as uh 
as I mentioned before, customer concentration, um, you know, who controls your business? Is that yourself? Uh, is, is, uh, or is it partners and agents around the world? Um, are you concentrated in certain verticals, uh, certain trade lanes, et cetera? What does your management team look like? Um, is, is your business model uh, scalable for a buyer that comes in? And 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 what are you what are you basically what are you what are you giving a buyer? Um, what what is the value of your company um, to to the specific buyer? <clears throat> so all these things um, play into it. Um, so there's there's no easy answer to say what what is the what is the exact um, multiple for for your company. I, I I agree with Michael. 100% when you're looking at traditional companies. And you can see Nikhil smiling because he knows what's coming next. What I think has brought this all into play is how e-companies, be they SaaS companies or actually operating companies, are valued. They are not valued on profit. They are not valued on anything I learned in B-School or any of us did, they are valued on what they can convince investors they are worth. So you have companies who have under $200 million in sales and losses that are $30, $40 million a year with market caps of $800 million to a $1.3 billion. You have the Molo deal with ArcBest. You have so many deals you could point to because of this rush to perceived technology. So people come to us and they say, well, I'm seeing these valuations. How do I get to that? And the answer is you can't. And I think Michael was right on point when he said, what you have to do is look at your client, look at your customer and evaluate what is good for them. And in a traditional business, using a guitar or maybe a GP as a basis. And then saying, okay, what else is there? Okay, you're in refrigerated. There is a value in refrigerated right now. Everybody wants it. So, okay, let's say you, you have a 10 multiple or a six EBITDA. Well, you know, you're going to get something for that. You have a super duper top of the line CEO who's going to stay on five years, is going to keep skin in the game. You're going to get value for that. Maybe not up front, but in the end. And it becomes this additive process of why am I different? You know, and that's the reason why, you know, average valuations, average EBITDAs don't work because, you know, if you're 12 is the average, you could be 14 or you could be 10. And, and so, I, but I think a lot of the consternation comes because people are seeing these ridiculous, and they are ridiculous valuations of companies. And then sort of, what, what I think are some rather bad deals that may come back to haunt people and overpaying based on the same perception. And the other, the other thing you, you generally you will generally notice, and Arcbest is a little bit different, is most of these valuations come from PEs, come from VCs, even come from family funds. They generally do not come from the marketplace. So you know, the recent hub purchase of, um, the kid, what's the company? Uh, Trap Tank. Trap Tank. Was, not, was, not, was not a crazy multiple. Traditional company into a traditional company. Um, so I, I just think that people read the Wall Street Journal too much and read too much about, you know, what kind, uh, you know, how much money yeah. an e-broker, an e-forwarder is getting, and they try to say, well, why aren't we like that? Well, the answer is you're just not. The answer is no different than why does tech get more than non-tech? People just believe that if you can hit on one deal and you have the Google, you could lose on 150 and you're going to come out ahead. And everyone's looking for the Google. That is well said, Ron. I think this market is uh, really uh, seeing some bizarre deals in the last five to seven years. Uber freight buying Transplace, Transplace getting changing hands three times to a financial buyer, which is the most um, surprising part. Um, the Jordan company buying global trans and within less than a year for selling them more than two turns to uh, Providence Equity. So there's a lot of financials in play. Um, huge amount of flight of capital coming from the VC market. 
into transportation technology, what, what I call digital freight companies. Um, so there is a VC model and there's a traditional model. And this, they are in conflict because a lot of performer valuations you see in the market which haven't really converted into a real actual delivered value because nobody has exited formally. Um, uh, now, uh, Aaron, from your perspective, it, this huge increase in valuations, expectations, obviously, obviously, the entrepreneur is expecting a tremendous amount of value. Uh, well, I want ex because of I, I think one of my colleagues said very recently, I said, you don't take the multiples to the bank, you take the dollars to the bank. Yeah. That's right. And so ultimately, when you when you talk about the dollars, um, and now that we are expecting significant expansion of that enterprise value in the logistics space, how do you think this really comes to affect the entrepreneurs' uh, net proceeds and, and all the financial dynamic around the transaction? Yeah, awesome. I, a bunch of thoughts come to mind. So first of all, what we do um, is we're going to, you know, meet in advance with an entrepreneur and we're going to throw all their hopes and dreams into a, a big cauldron and we're going to figure out the costs of everything that they might hope, wish and desire for the rest of their lives. We're going to figure out um, on a future cash flow model how much they need. Um, so you start there. You know, if I've got a hundred million dollar company and I need 25 million, well, then I've got a lot of wiggle room, right? And I can do some tax planning and some wealth transfer planning. But the point is, let's figure out how much I need first so that I know, you know, the game I'm playing in and whether I can exceed that. Um, I, I, I will share anecdotally that we have found um, sellers really comfortable with a certain value and then they get really excited during the process. And somehow that inches up and creeps up. And by the time uh, all is said and done. They've got a great. Um, they've got the ability to close on a number that's far far exceeds their initial uh, desire, and they still don't feel great about it because you know they're reading the Wall Street Journal to to Ron's point. So um, you know, keep we do the planning for a particular reason. Uh, another example where the desire was to. Uh, basically take half the pot, half the windfall up front at close and then the second half in an earnout. And because we had previously built the plan, the structure was there. All we had to do was toggle a few numbers and show that, you know what, your, your nest egg is locked in with this first bite. Um, all your essential goals are covered. It's OK to keep that um, keep those two out in the bush. Uh, for potential upside to accomplish some more aspirational goals. So for us, it comes down to goal discovery, understanding of the financial needs of the of the entrepreneur, and then continue to has, have those changed. If they haven't changed, let's just compare how the numbers are, are working out. And then if I may add, um, you know, Nikhil, you showed a slide that was really, really interesting. It showed the growth in average EBITDA multiples on one side, and then all those factors that are idiosyncratic, all those factors that a business owner can actually control. And those are the factors, I don't care what the average EBITDA multiple is, those are the factors that are either gonna put you above average or below average. Um, Ron alluded to that question around recession. Well, you know, those factors that you put up, Nikhil, those are within the entrepreneur's control. Guessing at the next recession, very difficult and, and very much outside of, uh, a seller's control. So I would say, you know, keep your eye on the prize, do what you're good at, focus on the things you can control. And if you're in good hands, you're going to get that above average multiple, you know, regardless of the economic condition or the, or the business cycle. A very smart person said to me recently that too many people look at multiples and go forward. And to Aaron's point, you should be figuring out what the client needs looking at the market and work and work backwards from that and see if you can get that valuation and hopefully manage the expectation of the client. You know, if a client says, I want $75 million, sure, that sounds great, but can you really do it for them? And I know, you know, this isn't a commercial for you guys, but you know, there, Logison has a very substantial vetting process to make sure that there's um, the expectations and reality are in line with each other before they take on a client. 
And and that's and I and I believe from a cell size, deals fall apart when the expectation falls apart. So that's why I believe in working backwards and not even talking multiples. You know, with the expertise. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Um so as, as we see, there's, there's definitely um, a, a moment in time right now. Uh, you know, valuations are probably at an, at an all-time high. So, um, so with, with this moment in time and now, you know, talking about potentially upcoming recessions, um, when we talk to clients and, and potential clients, um, if they're thinking about selling at some point, uh, and have had those thoughts maybe one year, two years, three years, five years from now, maybe a good time to think about moving that timeline up um, because we don't know how long the market is going to stay like this. Um, so just some food for thought for those out there that have thoughts. Yeah, with with the expertise on this panel, I think one hour is really not enough because uh, we, we can just go on and on and on. Unfortunately, we got to draw a line. We're coming to a... Uh, 12.58, two minutes to go. Uh, before Marsha tells me to, to kind of to get to the, to the finish line, I wanted to uh, provide, give thanks to all our panelists uh, who provided their tremendous expertise. I hope our attendees will get a lot of value add. Uh, our, our panelists uh, with their coordinates will be available for any contacts that you may want to do. Uh, uh, they are, you can do this on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, yeah, we will hopefully provide a recorded copy of this uh, edited video at some point once it is available to those who missed this session. Uh, this is tremendous value add in my view. I think with the expertise on this panel, uh, with almost 40 plus years from Ron and Michael and uh, equally and with Aaron, uh, I think we are lucky to have such a distinguished panel providing their contributions. Uh, and thank you to Sifa and Bruce uh, for really a lot uh, to, to really allowing us to have this educational sessions for Sifa membership. Uh, in turn, also wide open to other other people who are registering for this event, um, and we hope that this will provide some a lot of value add to everybody. If you have a minute to do your closing statements, gentlemen, you're free to do it. You just got a minute each. Ron, I went first before. Okay, <laughs> not to. Um, this is a very exciting time. It's been probably 30 years since I've seen a market like this in transportation. Um, coming out of deregulation, there was a lot of combining and such in the U.S. and similarly uh, in Canada in the same time frame. Uh, I, you know, I, I would just like to say again what Michael said, I think anyone who owns a business nowadays in this space has to make a decision, am I going to invest substantial capital to keep up with the people who are, you know, moving along at the top, either the very large players or the E players, or is it time for me to cash out? I've built this great business. And even if you don't cash out, time for me to bring on a partner so that I'm not the one playing out the capital, but I can still get growth benefit. And I think if I was sitting in one of these businesses, and one of my very best friends is, and I gave him the same advice I'm giving to you. What do you want to be in five years? And what risk do you want to take that you're not going to be able to get the money to get through with us right now? And that's an individual decision for everybody. But I think it's something everyone in this sphere who's not, you know, uh, Hapag Lloyd or C.H. Robinson or Kuna Nagel should be thinking of. Michael? I'll just say, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say thanks. Uh, I just want to say thanks to you, Nikhil, and and Ron and Michael. Uh, uh, you know, to be able to speak with uh, owners and executives at these uh, businesses. You know, um, just again, thank thank them for taking the time today and giving us the chance to have this discussion. 
again, you're moving the world forward. Uh, you're the backbone of the North American economy. And so um, many thanks. We get the last word, Michael. Yes, so thank you, Nikhil. I'm happy, very happy to be on this panel here. Thanks, Ron and, and Aaron. Uh, just uh, repeating myself here, um, like I said, we, we see a moment in time. So uh, if you're thinking about selling, you talk, talk to your uh, M&A advisor or your advisors in general and, and see if this is perhaps uh, the, the right time for you to do it. <clears throat> Um, we don't know how long it's going to last, so we, we're happy to, our door is always open for a, a virtual or in-person cup of coffee and, and have that discussion. Thank you very much, Marsha. You, thank uh, you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nikhil, Ron, Michael, and Aaron for a very informative session. And thank you for everyone that joined um, as a participant um, today for this Logistics m and Maximizing Value for Sellers complimentary SIPA member to member webinar brought to you today by Logistics and Advisors. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, all. Thank you. You're Bye. welcome. Thank you. Bye.